once you've identified the lesion, we have to be sure, is it a mediastinal lesion or is it something else? The two main lesions we need to differentiate it from is pulmonary lesions and cardiac lesions. So mediastinal versus pulmonary, there are a few points which may help us to differentiate. The mediastinal lesions have a smooth contour. They usually form an obtuse angle with the surface. There is absence of the air bronchogram. They may be seen extending bilaterally. All the mediastinal lines that we described as uh, till now, they may disrupt those. And they may have associated spinal, costal, and sternal abnormalities. Whereas lung lesions are usually surrounded by air, they form an acute angle with the surface. They may contain air bronchograms and usually unilateral. So this is how a mediastinal mass uh, and a lung mass will look schematically. The mediastinal mass sits under the surface of the mediastinum and it creates an obtuse angle with the lung. This is a lung mass which ab abuts the mediastinal surface and creates an acute angle with the lung surface. Now again, as you can see, there is a mediastinal mass which is allowing uh, the right mediastinal border and this uh, turned out to be a thymoma. This is a lesion which is seen in the right upper zone which is forming an acute border with the mediastinum. This is a lung mass which turned out to be a pancos tumor. Now this is how we differentiated mediastinal and pulmonary lesions. Now to differentiate between mediastinal and cardiac lesions, we have the hilum overlay sign and the hilum convergence sign. Now the hilum overlay sign says that if you can visualize the hilar vessels through a mediastinal mass, then the mass does not arise from the hilum. So as you can see, this is a large mass out here and we can see the pulmonary hilar vessels through the mass. So this does not arise in the region of the hilum. Because of the way the mediastinum is made, most of these masses will be located in the anterior mediastinum. This same lesion which, which is seen on a CT scan, which turned out to be a lymphoma in an HIV positive patient. Again, the hilum convergence sign, this is basically to distinguish a bulky hilum due to pulmonary artery hyperplasia from a juxta hilum mass or a lymph nodal alarmage. If the pulmonary artery branches are visible through the opacity and these branches converge towards the waist of the heart, that means they are going inwards towards the heart, this is a positive hilum convergence sign and this opacity is likely to be due to a juxta hilum mediastinal mass. However, if the pulmonary artery branches lead towards the abnormal bump, then the opacity is likely to be due to an enlarged pulmonary artery, which is called as the negative hilum convergence sign. Now, once we've decided that there is a lesion and it is a mediastinal lesion, it is important to put it into a compartment. Uh, there have been many classifications and divisions. The anatomy is divided into four parts. There is a classification which is mainly on the uh, lateral chest graph given by Felsen, which we follow, which is divided into three parts. But it's important to note that these divisions are all theoretical rather than physical, and that the disease can spread from one compartment to the another, and that some diseases do not exclusively occur in any one compartment. Let's look at the Felsen's classification. These are basically based on findings of the lateral chest radiograph. There are two lines we must draw. One line is extending from the diaphragm to the thoracic inlet along the back of the heart and anterior to the trachea. It separates the anterior and the middle mediastinum. So everything which is anterior to the line is the anterior mediastinum. Then the second line is a line that connects points one centimeter beyond the anterior margin of the vertebra. This separates the middle and the posterior mediastinum. So between the first line and the second line is the media, middle mediastinum, behind the second line is the posterior mediastinum. On the radiograph to differentiate into which compartments we have a few signs, the silhouette sign, the cervicothoracic sign and the thoracoabdominal sign. Now the silhouette sign says if an intrathoracic lesion is in anatomic contact with the heart or the aorta or the diaphragm, it will obscure that border or the silhouette if it has the same density. This is well demonstrated here. There is loss of the cardiac silhouette with the border of the heart on the right side with relatively low density. The CD scan showed an epicardial, prominent epicardial fat pad which is seen on the right side. Once we've decided there is a lesion, there is a mediastinal lesion, which compartment it is, then it is also important to narrow down the differential diagnosis de depending upon the content of the lesion. So basically we should look at fat. if there is fat, is there a calcification or is there fluid? Now these are the fat containing, common fat containing lesions, thymolipoma, teratomas, eusophageal lipomas, and so on. This is an anterior mediastinal lesion which contains macros macroscopic fat. 
There are some cystic areas and there are some solid areas also. This turned out to be a teratoma. Uh, these are the lesions which contain calcific foci, or dense areas of calcification. As you can see on the frontal and the lateral radiograph, you can see a rim calcified lesion, rim calcified lesion within the anterior mediastinum. On the CD scan, again, this turned out to be an enhancing rim calcified lesion in the anterior mediastinum, which was diagnosed as a thymoma. Now, what are the fluid containing lesions? The common ones in the anterior mediastinum, thymic cyst, then we have the thymomas, teratomas, pericardial cyst, forgot duplication cysts, and so on. Now, this is a simple unilocular cystic lesion which is seen in the anterior mediastinum. This turned out to be a thymic cyst. Now, more important also is uh, after the contents, does the lesion enhance or does it not enhance? The enhancing lesions are obviously hyper-enhancing lymph nodes, thyroid tissues, paraganglionomas, hemangiomas, and any vascular lesions. As you can see here, a descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. In addition to this, we need to see whether there are any associated abnormalities. If there are presence of localized pulmonary lesions in addition to the mediastinal abnormalities, as occurs in malignancies and tuberculosis, if there is any abnormal, abdominal involvement in addition to thoracic, as happens if there is a rare pseudocyst in the thorax, neuroblastomas, and if there are any associated vertebral anomalies such as neuroentric cysts and neurogenic tumors. So most of this diagnosis can be made up to the content of the lesions on chest radiography. But what is the role of computer tomography in mediastinal lesions? To define which compartment is it formed? Yes, to confirm which compartment. What is the content of the lesion? What is the enhancement of the lesion? Any associated abnormalities? And based on the divisional description, ultimately, we need to give a diagnosis based on the CD findings. But there were different classifications by anatomists. There were different classifications by surgeons and different classifications by radiologists. So there was a need to have a classification based solely on cross-sectional imaging because that is what gives us the final diagnosis. So this International Thymic Malignancy Interest Group came out with a classification in roughly around 2015-2016 based solely on the cross-sectional findings on CT. They divided the mediastinum into three compartments. One is the prevascular compartment which is basically uh, bounded superiorly by the thoracic inlet, inferiorly by the diaphragm, anteriorly by the sternum, and posteriorly, which is, which is important to note, by the anterior aspect of the pericardium as it wraps around the heart. Okay, the contents include thymus, fat, lymph nodes, and the left brachiocephalic vein. The visceral compartment was anteriorly bounded by the posterior boundary of the prevascular compartment, and posteriorly by the vertical line connecting a point on the thoracic vertebral bodies one centimeter posterior to the anterior margin. And the paravertebral compartment was by the anti posterior body of the visceral compartment and uh, the posteriorly by a vertical line against the posterior margin of the chest wall. So this is schematically how this division looks like. Prevascular compartment outlined in red, the visceral compartment outlined in blue and the paravertebral compartment outlined in yellow. These are various sections at the level of the aortic arch, the left pulmonary artery and at the left atrium which shows how the division of the mediastinum runs through and through. Again, based on this division, we have certain divisions which occur in certain compartments. And we can divide these based on the content of these lesions into solid cystic and fatty lesions. So as you can see in the prevascular compartment, there's a large lobular heterogeneous prevascular lesion with a large amount of macroscopic fat there are some soft tissue within it and there are some fluid density with this. This turned out to be a mature teratoma. Again, there is a well-defined low attenuation lesion in the thymic bed in the prevascular region. This is unilocular with no evidence of any internal septa or soft tissue. This turned out to be a benign unilocular thymic cyst. In the visceral compartment, basically, you can divide it into solid and cystic lesions. Again, you can see a well-circumscribed homogeneous subcarinal lesion which is seen indenting the left atrium. This is a bronchogenic cyst. The paravertebral compartments basically most of the lesions which occur here, that is 75% of the lesions are of neurogenic origin. These include peripheral nerve sheet tumors such as schwannoma, neurofibromas, plexiform neurofibromas and malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumors, sympathetic ganglia tumors and paraganglia paraganglioma tumors. The non-neurogenic tumors account for only about 25% of the lesions which we can see. Again, these can be divided into solid cystic lesions. You can see that there is a well-defined heterogeneous soft tissue lesion in the right paravertebral mediastinum. 
and on biopsy this turned out to be a benign peripheral nerve sheet tumor. Now you must understand that you must see these lesions not only in the mediastinal window but also the bone window because it is important to differentiate between benign and malignant lesions. The benign lesions usually cause just erosion, pressure erosion of the adjacent vertebra but if there is destruction or invasion of the bones then that goes more in favor of a malignant lesion. An MRI at this uh, point in time also helps us to delineate whether there is any intraspinal extension. So what is the role of MRI in mediastinal lesions? One, it is a most useful imaging modality if there is a confusion whether the lesion is cystic or solid. Example, if there are thymic cysts, uh, to differentiate thymic cysts from solid thymic neoplasms. Whether uh, there are any cystic or necrotic components to delineate septae within lesions or soft tissue components within cystic lesions. Then for evaluating neurogenic tumors and extent into the spinal canal, MRI is also uh, useful in those cases. In cardiac, intracardiac tumors, it is helpful in delineating intracardiac tumors. Uh, in patients with renal failure in which we cannot give IV contrast, a plain MRI helps us also to delineate the vascular uh, abnormalities. So in conclusion, CT is the modality of choice in evaluation of mediastinal lesions. Tissue content of the lesion is important in arriving at a diagnosis. Some lesions can be diagnosed based only on the imaging criteria such as restosal goiter, fat containing lesions like lipomas, thymo, thymolipomas and purely cystic lesions. Most other lesions need to be correlated with clinical details, tumor markers and histopathology. And the ITMIC division or the ITMIC classification helps us in identifying and precisely identifying mediastinal abnormalities at cross-sectional imaging.